Right, I'm going to talk to you about my experiences in, in a catchment where nutrients into waterways were capped. Uh, a couple of caveats, because uh, obviously the theme for this for today is lessons that you can take out. Um, I need you to understand that the topal water body is what they call nitrogen limited. Um, so nitrogen was the crucial element that we were dealing with. Um, you will need to understand what the, the limiting element is in your catchment if you're going to learn from this process. The second thing is that our soils, um, topal pumice and topal loam, are incredibly free draining. Um, so if you're in heavier soils, then some of the issues that I will raise won't be as, as critical. But if you're on free draining um, Canterbury gravels, then um, your story will be fairly similar to ours. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, uh, the context in which I farm, or welcome to my world. Um, I'm also going to look at some of the issues in relation to the farming business model because I think if you're going to impose emissions caps on farming, you have to start thinking about how you're going to farm in a different way under those emissions caps. And then some thoughts. I've spent 10 years on this process. It's dominated my life. You spend a lot of time when you're out on the farm thinking about the impact of this sort of stuff. So I'll give you a, a couple of comments there and then I'll talk about the science needs that fall out of my particular situation. A map of the catchment. Uh, that's the entire land area that drains into the lake. The, um, the piece down the bottom here didn't originally drain into the lake but the Tongariro Power Scheme captured the water from the headwaters of the Whanganui and the Mangatapopo stream and several others and dragged it into the catchment. But the couple of points uh, I, I'd like to emphasise. The dark green there is plantation forestry and we're up to our third rotation in that area now. I can just about remember when the first one was planted so that makes me feel old. Um, this area here is the dark green area is native bush. It's in Forest Park. There's more on this side, the Puriora National Park. The lighter green to the north of the catchment and predominantly to the west, a little bit in the south, uh, is farmland. Only 20% of the catchment is under farmland. 80% is in original native vegetation or plantation forestry. I suspect that most of you farm in catchments where those percentages are reversed. In other words, you're talking about 80% of the catchment under farmland and, and less than 20% in the native uh, vegetation. So the issues that you will deal with in terms of the economic impact of any emissions caps will be an order of magnitude greater than the ones that we dealt with. Uh, that's my property. Uh, on the western side of the lake, um, it doesn't quite look it there, but we're probably, there's, there's at least a kilometre of dock reserve between my boundary and the lake shore. We're on the Western Bay Cliffs, so we're 200 metres in altitude above the surface of the lake. Those cattle there, when they pee on the ground, it takes 50 years for the nitrogen in their urine to get to the lake, but it gets there. Um, I'm going to make some comments about science. I need you to understand that I'm very pro-science. AgriSearch had probably the largest farm scale trial they've ever run uh, over a five to six year period on our farm. Those, oops, those white pegs represent a thousand underground collectors that were put on 15 hectares of our property and we ran a range of different beef scenarios over those years to look at ways of increasing our beef production under a nitrogen cap. I don't have to rely on overseer to model what I'm leaching. I know what I'm leaching based on those um, collectors and the figures are very close to what overseer would model. We also have a permanent deep drainage lysimeter facility run by Landcare Research on our farm at the moment, it's going through a four-year trial looking at what sort of leaching we get under lucerne. Um, 
the, the figures in Overseer at the moment are largely modelled and they, they treat lucerne on our soils as leaching 19 kilograms per hectare per annum. I believe it will be a lot less than that and we won't know until the trials uh, finish in three to four years time. So I've lived science or lived the science of this issue and, and have some strong feelings about its contribution. A bit of history, we became aware of the issue in 2000. Um, we finally nailed the legislation and the process and the catchment cap in 2012 at the end of last year. So it was a 12 year journey. Um, I would hope for your sake that if you're dealing with this issue it doesn't take that long. It's too hard on people to have that much uncertainty around for that long. We took legal advice, we formed an incorporated society to represent the farmers in the catchment uh, in our negotiations with the regional council. We formed an incorporated society because that was the best vehicle for attracting research funding and, and sponsorship. Uh, there wasn't a lot of research in the catchment when we started this process. Most of the assumptions were based on stuff outside the catchment. We wanted to know what was actually happening in our catchment. Uh, we probably raised over that 12 years um, somewhere between three and four million dollars worth of science funding and several hundred thousand dollars worth of legal costs to take the issue to the Environment Court. You need to think about that issue if you're getting involved in this process. Um, we had a dual focus. We wanted to balance lake protection with farmer viability. And those two things were run in tandem for the entire 12 years. Um, there were 105 farms in the catchment, over 100 hectares. Half of those were owned by Māori economic authorities and half in private ownership. We managed to keep about 98% of the farmers involved together and on the same page for 12 years. Um, that was a fairly difficult task at times. And, I'm, and, I, and the other point I would make is this was all sorts of farms. It was dairy farms and sheep and beef. Uh, we needed to work together. You cannot segregate this issue as and say it's a dairy problem or whatever. It's everyone that farms in a catchment contributes to the catchment load. This is what we had to accept. Um, all that tussock native uh, bush uh, that I talked about is leaching three kilograms. That's the ambient pre-human level. Uh, plantation forest leaches the same. We wanted to believe that forestry leached a lot more than that and the pollen was contributing to the nitrogen and all sorts of other things when we started. In the end we had to accept that over a 30 year rotation that's what it leaches. Um, we know now that the sheep and beef farms in the catchment leach on average 17. So that's five times the ambient level. The four dairy farms in the catchment, and there was only four, um, are 45 kilograms plus. We leach 93% of the manageable nitrogen that's going into the lake. We wanted it to be all the batches and the septic tanks and the, the town and whatever else you could hope for. It wasn't, it was us. Um, and this is some of my realities. This is not a fertiliser issue. This is a stock urine issue. Um, if you're going to cap stock urine, you are essentially capping stocking rates. And under the commodity regime that we currently operate here in New Zealand, that's a cap on income. We had to remove 20% of that manageable nitrogen from the lake. That worked out at 170 tonnes of leached nitrogen per annum had to be taken out of the system. We had 50,000 hectares of farmland. Um, we've got the 20% but it has resulted in either the complete shutting down or the covenanting and reduced production of 35,000 hectares of that 50,000. I'm a member of the Lake Topol Protection Trust, which was the trust that did that job. Um, we had a budget of $81 million, basically to either buy up farms at, at valuation and then on sell them to forestry companies and have them planted at a cheap, and, and the cost of, the, the difference in price was the cost of the nitrogen. 
Um, for some farmers, they've chosen not to shut down their whole farm. They've chosen to accept a lower stocking rate. They have a covenant on their property for 999 years. Why is it that figure? That's the longest that you can covenant land in this country under current law. If science could have provided us with a different answer, we would have spent that 81 million on trying to keep those farms in business rather than shutting them down. But there was, there was nothing and there is nothing on the horizon at the moment that would allow us to take 20% of the manageable end out of the catchment and keep that farming or keep intensifying farming. Um, we had until 2018 to achieve that 20%. We signed the final contract last week. Uh, we have got the 20% now five years ahead of time. Um, I'm not sure that that's a cause for celebration. I'm still very ambivalent about that whole process and what we had to do. Manageable N is any N that's derived from human activity, and in this case it was farming. So if we can't stop the nitrogen that falls onto the surface of the lake in the rain, so that's not manageable. We can only deal with the nitrogen that comes from farming, essentially. Uh, the septic tanks and the, the batches that, that introduce 7% of the N, they've also had to take a 20% cut in what they, they introduce into the lake. So this is 20% is of the farming load. I'm now a consented farmer. I required to um, meet consent conditions in order to carry out my basic farming operations. The council will look at that as though they're, they're giving me a consent to carry on what I'm doing. I have a different take. I'm limiting my production in perpetuity which is a hang of a long time. I cannot grow my income or through increased production ever again unless science can come up with something that allows me to do that. The five-year trials by AgriSearch basically showed that the only thing I could have done to increase my production and stay within my cap was to use DCD. And it wasn't to broadcast it on, we were actually drenching the animals with DCD so it was coming out with the urine. That is no longer in the toolbox. Everything else that we tried had either uh, a minimal impact on our leaching status or was too impractical to put in place in a farming situation. We modelled six farms for the Environment Court, ranging from the extensive operation through to a highly intensive um, my farm was one of them. Um, all of those farms were technically insolvent within five to seven years if they'd had any level of debt. And we'll talk about that in, at, at, a, at greater depth in a moment. Um, one of the things that the council wanted was a five-year consent to farm. We were never going to get banks to lend on farms if that was the case. The longest that you can apply for a consent to do anything under the RMA is 35 years. So that's where we started in the negotiation process. Under horse trading that occurs in the Environment Court, we settled on 25. It's about the length of a mortgage, it's about the length of a rotation of pine trees. At least I know what I can do now as a farmer for the next 25 years. And one large um, corporate dairy farmer has moved into the catchment uh, and bought up nitrogen off other farms and is establishing further dairy farms in the catchment because he has that certainty. So. Um, I'm capped at my 2004 uh, production level and in that time beef and lamb tell me that my costs have risen 48%. My accountant and my wife would tell me that those figures are probably no, even higher in terms of costs. But um, that's, this to me is the fundamental issue that we aren't talking about when we're talking about emissions capping in this country. I've had to discontinue breeding cows. Uh, mature animals are, are much less efficient at converting grass into protein and they're very leaky. I run my business now on dollars profit per kilogram of N leached. So 
if I do the numbers, mature breeding cows, I used to run a Hereford Frisian breeding cow with a terminal simmental sire over them and produce really good weaners and really fi good finishing cattle. But it's too much, I leach too much for the dollars I earn. So I now buy in weaners at six months of age and I finish them as rapidly as possible. I cannot afford to run them through a second winter because they become as inefficient as dairy cows, as, as breeding cows. My life is ruled by overseer. It's the regulatory tool um, that dominates what I have to do. Uh, so if it's not in overseer, it doesn't exist for me. I can't use it. We get whiz-bang fertilizer people and all sorts of people coming to the catchment uh, all the time telling us if you use my, my product you won't leach anything. Um, most of that is absolute rubbish but I just say to them well if you haven't got your product registered with AgriSearch and an overseer it's absolutely no use to me because even if it did work I can't get the credit for it. Um, without sounding big headed I'm in the top quintile for beef and lamb production of beef per hectare and dollars per hectare of beef but the point I make there is I can't do any more. I can't produce more to get out of this cost squeeze. And certainly I cannot do it and, and stay within my nitrogen cap. Um, okay, I've taken some figures from your area. Class 6, beef and land land. Um, to, to look at really the, well I guess this is the issue that I would want you to spend some time thinking about if you're also going to talk about emissions capping in your catchment. Um, in 1984-85 when uh, uh, subsidies were taken away from us, um, the return from your farmland here was before tax $80 something per hectare. That gave you a return on investment of 3%. 2007-2008, a drought year for many, your return on your return per hectare was $21. These are all beef and lamb economic service figures, they're not mine. Um, your return on your investment was 0.4 of a percent. 2010, 2011, the returns per hectare are now $293. Sounds a lot better, but your return on investment is 1%. And if you're looking at these figures here, compared to there, back in 84, the rolling three year average spend on fertilizer for your area was $8,000 a hectare. The rolling fertilizer spend, the three year average for this, this period, is something in the order of $60,000. So our costs have gone up at a far greater rate than our income. Per farm. Per farm. Hmm. Um, this is another way of graphing the same thing. It looks pretty good when you look at the, the profit per hectare, but my $84, $85 bought me a hang of a lot more. I could spend, I could pay all my rates, regional and district council rates, with the profit from one cattle beast in 1984-85. This year uh, the profit required to um, pay my rates comes from 22 animals. Um, the return on investment graph is the one that I think we should be all looking at and the whole meat industry action stuff is, is probably a symptom or an ex ex a, 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 a sense of frustration I suppose based around that issue. But the point I, I think we all need to look at is this. During that time of declining returns on investment, look what we've done to our productivity. Um, that figure there, lamb sold per kilogram of ewe wintered. We've gone up 86%. Um, beef farmers haven't done so flash, we've only gone up 4%. Dairy farmers have gone up 31%. But lamb finishers are rock stars in terms of product, productivity increases. Yet go back to that previous graph, our return on investment is, is still declining. So we're running faster and faster to do less well. Believe me, I'm relentlessly positive about farming, even though it doesn't sound it at the moment. <laughs> um, so I can't grow any more meat per hectare under this model. And even if I was, it's still, I'm still um, 
it's still not a good business model. So Sharon and I decided that after we did the economic modeling for the environment court, it really sits you back on your heels. And I thought, I can't grow any more meat per hectare. The only option I've got is to expend, extend the value of the beef that I produce. So we wanted to test the assertion that consumers will pay a premium for a product that's grown under a catchment-wide plan that will protect, in our case, Lake Topol for the next 100 years or longer. And everyone said they won't. You know, you only get on the, you, you, this sort of thing just gets you around the negotiating table. People will not pay a premium. Um, we went to the regional council and said, I, I've now got to go through all these hoops in order to protect the lake. I've sent you monthly stock returns. I send you more information than I send I, IRD every year now, and I'm audited every year. Can we not turn that into the basis of a, an appellation or a brand value? And in the end, they've agreed. So everything that I jump through now in order to meet my requirements for my consent forms the basis of a claim that I can make to consumers that I'm growing my beef in a way that protects the waterway. Um, so they developed the Protecting Lake Taupo Tick and all our brochures, the table cards that we use in restaurants and, and all our other material carries that. And if you're a consented farmer in the catchment and you meet your audit requirements, then you are, and you meet the uh, meat quality requirements that we put down in, in relation to the brand, you're able to supply um, type or beef. Consumers have paid a significant premium. We've got restaurants and hotels climbing all over us to be part of this. Because the Hilton Hotel, for example, by buying meat that's grown in this way, it was the final thing they needed to do to get the Qualmark environmental gold standard for their hotel. So this thing, this sort of stuff does add to the brand value of restaurants and hotels. We've had, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at how you grow meat well under a cap, and there is a, there's some synergy between water quality and meat quality, and I won't go into that in detail now, but if you grow animals really fast every day of their lives and don't check them, the meat quality is fantastic. We're killing um, Charolais Angus cross heifers at 18 months um, at, with 280 kilogram carcass weight. The marbling score is as good as 36 month old cattle. The tenderness in blind tasting tests and the flavor is better. So you can grow meat really well and look after water. We can't meet the demand at the moment and we've been asked to extend it to Wellington and Auckland and then possibly look at export. Uh, we have just about built a business model that produces a premium back to farmers. The, the fa supplying farmers are now getting a premium over schedule uh, because of this. So to get to the point of this whole presentation, which is my science needs, um, this, is, this is basically how I see it from a farmer's perspective. I can farm under emissions caps, but in order to do so, my livestock numbers and the class of stock will be capped. In other words, I can't convert to a dairy farm because that leaches far more than my entitlement. That has significant implications for the value of my farm. Uh, my farm is now valued at a lot less than it was when we started this process. Um, farms in the Topor catchment now have their rateable value set based on their nitrogen discharge allowance. It's the first time in the country that rateable valuation is based on productive capacity. I can't get capital gain in an emissions capped environment. I need cash flow to compensate for that lack of capital gain. So if that's true, are we going to accept a consequent cap on our income or are we going to start thinking about the farming business model and look at it in a different way? Um, we don't hear too much about the consumer's role in this process and I've deliberately put up this sign because you are consumers as well as farmers. Um, at the Environmental Defence Society annual conference last year I was asked to speak. Uh, a thousand participants, they each paid $750 to go there, so that was three quarters of a million dollars for two days work that was into the Environmental Defence Society's coffers and we were against them in the Environment Court. Um, 
they are a very well organized group, they're extremely well funded and they're very, very active. Um, they had a dinner that night that was $250 a head to attend and I asked them that question. How did you choose the food that was served at that dinner? Bear in mind, these are the most environmentally aware consumers in the country and they're my target market. Did they know where to source that food? No, they didn't. We've never told them. We've never thought about this issue from a constructive point of view. We've never told them how, they can, how or where they can buy food that um, does stuff for water quality. My next question to them was, well, if you did know that, what premium would you be prepared to pay for that food? And in the end, is that not the real test of how much you value water quality? Because it's really easy as an urban consumer to bag farmers and say, you're degrading our waterways, but at the same time paying um, minimal price for food. I think as farmers, we've, we've actually taken the wrong tack on this issue. We framed the issue as a scrap between ourselves and regional councils, and we've not involved the consumer in the process. So if, if you take anything away from this, when you're talking to consumers, use that last statement. Eating is the final step in the agricultural process. So every person that eats food is contributing to the agricultural process and they are contributing, in this case, to water degradation. We have to get that message across to consumers if we're to, bait, to take this debate anywhere. So this is a couple of thoughts. I don't believe that as a nation we can continue to have conversations around protecting water quality without having a parallel set of conversations that look at the farming business model and redefine it. If we don't do the two, neither of them is going to come out of this process very well. And if in, in relation to science, how do we start facilitating conversations that fund science within this context? I don't believe we can continue to occupy the agricultural commodity market and mandate catchment limits, water quality limits, or biodiversity protection. The two just do not go together. The only way that I can see of doing that is to establish brand values for our agricultural produce, produce such that we get enough premium for them that we can pay for those water quality caps and the biodiversity issues that we're trying to deal with. So what are my immediate science needs? This is just at a da you know, daily level right now, and then I'll talk about the broader ones as they relate to those two previous thoughts. All science output from now on to be of any value to me at all has got to be described in terms of dollars profit that I can get from implementing that science per kilogram of nitrogen leached. It's no value to me otherwise. All those science outputs that we're talking about have to be embedded in Overseer. If they're not in Overseer, they don't exist. I need science to start selecting and breeding animals that are far more efficient at converting grass into protein so that less of it comes out as nitrogen in the urine. This last one's a bit scary for me and it, it's um, following from the previous present presentation. Um, Cropping and pasture renewal in our catchment is a very leaky activity. It, it produces 150 to 250 kilograms of N per hectare leach to waterways. I suspect that over time we will not be able to continue to do that. So I need, so under, under conventional um, establishment and winter feeding, I may, the only way I may be able to crop in the future is spring establishment so that the crop goes in after the, the winter leaching period so that I'm not losing that pulse of nitrogen from the mineralized um, grass that was there previously um, to winter leaching. So I need science to think about those things and I need science to tell me whether or not I can produce high, pro high producing pasture or establish high producing pasture and keep them in perpetuity. 
The seed companies aren't going to fund that one, but um, those are just some of the things we need to start thinking about. And at a, if I go back to those previous two thoughts, this is what I want science, or I need science, to start thinking about. Can we come up with a way of profiling our agricultural produce such that we can put hand on heart and tell our customers around the world the impact that we're having on water quality? And can we do it in a way that's verifiable and will resonate globally such that we can extract a brand value or a premium for doing so. We'll put another way, we've got to start selling our food at its true price. We've sold our food way too cheap for the last hundred years, we've not included the environmental costs and we've mortgaged the environment because of it. At some point we're going to have to pay that mortgage back and that issue is in front of us now. So the bigger question for science is, if you accept what I'm saying there, uh, I'm open to challenge on any of it, if you accept that, what is science's role in that space going forward? I don't know, Mr Chairman, whether we have time for questions. So any questions? A very um, enlightening presentation that uh, will hit the hearts of many of us realise that uh, how unprepared we are and uh, Mike's very, very well um, constructed presentation um, should, should actually, and his knowledge in dealing with um, this issue of <coughs> nitrogen leaching and the environment, then um, we need to uh, be mindful of our own regions, what's going on. Tom. Uh, Mike, how would a land finishing system compare to the beef system? Uh, better. Um, you know, on a, in a scale of leak, leakiness, uh, sheep are the best, dairy cattle are the worst. Deer and beef cattle are intermediate. Um, so I could change my system from a beef finishing system to a lamb finishing system. But I've got to change from two wire electrics to, and, and so that. I'm nervous of, ch of putting capital into a property that's already constrained in value by this process and I, I want a bit of time to go trout fishing and climbing mountains. And, you like <laughs> so, hmm. and I like cattle, yeah, so it's all of that. But yeah, you're right. And, and I suspect that as regional councils and farmers start having conversations around this issue, and, and if you're talking about consents to irrigate being combined with consents to leach nitrogen into waterways, it may be that high intensity of lamb finishing is a better use for Canterbury land than dairying. Does that answer your question? Yeah, question. Phil. Chris. Yep, Phil. Yep, yep. The profits wouldn't be there though. True, but if, if we could extract brand values around what lamb does to the environment, maybe we could. And, and I mean, let's not get too carried away with the profitability of dairying. I mean, sure, they, they've just announced $7.20 payout next year, but if I read an article by AgriSearch the other day, if you were to get the same real price as uh, a dairy farmer did in 2000, Fonterra needs to be paying $13 a kilogram next year. Because they're facing the same cost squeezes that we are. Um, it's just that it's flavour of the month and it's got a whole hi hype around it and, and they're looking at daring through rose tinted glasses. But if you do the same critical analysis, they're facing the same issues. Pete. All of those will, issues will be um, part of whatever the final answer is, but the issue that's never been researched is that the depth of the roots of the plant. Um, all the, the work that is used to put lucerne in at 19 and overseer at the moment has had um, ceramic cups or, or lysimeters at 600 mils. So they've only taken the nitrogen leaching below the conventional pasture root zone, whereas lucerne in our case goes down two meters. So the lysimeters and the treatment 
uh, on our property are one and a half metres deep, still not deep as roots can go, but they weigh three tonnes each and you couldn't really make them any bigger and manage them. So we're interested to see whether nitrogen that trickles down below that 600 mil level uh, is taken up by the plant. And I have this hope that most, most organisms don't waste any free food and, and that the lucerne is capturing that nitrogen as it goes down. But, and and that we've only had one winter's results and, and there was a pulse of nitrogen from the cultivation to establish the lucerne. But I'm quite hopeful that the next three years will show that it may be in the order of eight or nine kilograms of N rather than 19. And that's, that's a game changer for us. Boyd? Yep, um, we, we, in one of the trials we did on our property was using high sugar grasses. Less protein, more carbohydrate, that sort of thing. Um, the problem is the establishment of these grasses and the pulse of nitrogen that you get when you establish them. Uh, and then any savings that you make have got to be greater over the life of that pasture than the original losses. Um, I, the other thing is that whatever you use has got to be winter active. Because this, this is a problem that occurs over winter when you've not got much happening and not much uptake of the nitrogen that's in the urine patches. So whatever species you use have got to be winter active um, and, and as deep rooted as possible. Um, there, I have some hope that plantain will be useful in that regard. Um, and, and a lot of farmers in the catchment are, are doing their own thing with plantain at the moment to see what will happen. But when it, it's got to go into overseer to be really effective. Okay, last question, Paul. Sorry, we're just times. Oh, we might have a couple. We'll have one more. Paul. Possibly an ignorant question, but what is it about nitrogen that makes it a pollutant? Um, well, good question. That's not an ignorant one, a really good one. I mean, nitrogen's the basis of life, it's the basis of protein. Um, so without nitrogen, nothing would live. It's just that when you stick nitrogen into a waterway, just like when you put it on your pasture, it promotes growth. And so you get algal growth in waterways when you add nitrogen and phosphorus. Taupo already has relatively high levels of phosphorus as a result of volcanic activity and its origins. So it's like a vegetable garden. If you've got all the other elements and then you add nitrogen, you'll grow really good vegetables. It's the same in the lake. So it's just that it's a nutrient that promotes growth. <laughs> That's the okay, issue. Last question, thanks. Uh, sorry, this Jim, there's your hands up everywhere. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, one more. <laughs> okay, um, I was, I was um, in the Environment Court, I was um, the council for the regional council, he was a really bright man. He asked me a series of questions and then suddenly at a point I knew that was the question he was going to ask me. And this was in the Environment Court and, and our lives depended on it. So my answer then, and it's still the same now, is overseas has got some warts, it's got some problems, but it's the best thing that we've got to do the job at the moment. I think as farmers, if we try and push back on this issue until overseer is perfected, um, the issue will run all over us. We have to accept that overseer has problems, but it's the best tool in the kit at the moment. Thanks. Last one's Jim. Well, that's a sort of follow-up on my question. In your situation, you have this information from the most eminent dangers of the overseer model. Do they actually correlate highly? They do, and, and um, the trials on our farm um, were used to confirm some of the assumptions in, uh, in overseer. How close was it? To repeat the question? Yeah. Sorry, repeat the question. Uh, sorry, sorry the, que the question was uh, do, do the lysimeters and the overseer program have a similar correlation? Very, very close. Um, I can't remember the percentages, differences, but um, Dr. Stuart Ledgard, who's kind of Mr. Nitrogen within AgriSearch, he oversaw the trials and um, he and Mark Shepherd from Overseer were very comfortable that the results that came from our property um, matched what would have been modelled. I mean, I kind of hope that it wouldn't, <laughs> but it does. <laughs> um, you, that, are we okay. done, Mr. Yes, Chairman? Thanks. I think we're probably yeah, out of we're time. Done. Thanks, Mike. That is, um, I, I've enjoyed your presentation. I've heard Mike before. I think we've uh, all got a lot to go home and think about and certainly get involved in your own um, 
issues around your catchment management because um, if you don't as farmers then other people will design it for you. I, I agree with that comment from Bill. I mean, Europe, the Land and Water Forum and Nutrient Limits are going to, to um, basically tell you what the total load from the waterway that you live and farm in and zone committees will be established that will um, are the process for implementing those limits. If you don't understand these issues and if you don't get involved, there's plenty of other people on the zone committees will do it to you or for you. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mike.